Good morning, guys. I'm Mr. Chowdhury, a GCSE AQA examiner, English teacher, and the director of Supernova Tutors, which is a tuition company in Luton. Today, we'll be going through Act 1, Scene 3 of Macbeth. This is an online masterclass. So, the first thing we need to go through before we actually get into it is the concept of, of, of metonymy. Metonymy is removing individual identity. King Duncan says that no more that thane of Cordor shall deceive. Now, metonymy is a concept where if I say to you, let me give you a hand, what do I mean? The pen is mightier than the sword. What I've done is I've removed personal identity from something. King Duncan uses metonymy showing that the, the thane ship holds more importance than the actual thane of Cordor. He doesn't refer to him by his name. As a result, the title is more powerful than the actual person. In this instance, he disregards him. He does not respect him. He disrespects him by not acknowledging him as an actual individual. And this is ironic because by using metonymy and referring to his role, Duncan sets up the idea that it is the title, Thane of Cordor, that is deceptive. Now, in Act 1, Scene 3, Macbeth says, why do you dress me in these borrowed robes? Which refers back to the symbolically, the tainted robes being full of betrayal and being poisonous. And that's something we're going to go through today. So the summary of Act 1, Scene 3. Let's go through it. Macbeth and his friend Banquo, a fellow general in King Duncan's army, are returning back from battle when they encounter three witches on the heath. Now, if you remember anything from Act 1, Scene 1, the witches were meeting on a heath, which is a secluded area. The witches make prophecies regarding both of them, and they speak to them, confusing them. Now, Banquo and Macbeth react in completely different ways, and that's quite important for you to understand. Now, the context of it. Being deeply religious, Shakespeare's audience would have found the idea of destiny or fate something which is not too ridiculous of an idea. Now, the prophecy relates back to the fate and destiny that this is going to happen regardless of whether you want it to happen. Now, Shakespeare's audience is not a come to this. They actually understand this. They know that if someone gives a prophecy, that it's going to be going to come true. Whereas Banquo, on the other hand, he's more sceptical whether this is actually a prophecy that needs to be addressed. So, let's go through what a tragic hero is. A tragic hero is a literary character who makes a judgment error that inevitably leads to his own destruction. And here we have the concept that Shakespeare wants to portray and you need to write down in your exams the concept of Hamasha, the fatal flaw. Here, this is what we call the Achilles tendon, the Achilles heel. The one fatal flaw each character has that leads them to their downfall. For example, myself, let's say, for example, I have the fatal flaw of anger. Whenever something happens to me, I get angry. As a result, my fatal flaw, that wrath, that anger, one of the seven deadly sins, this leads me to my downfall. This is what we call the fatal flaw, the tragic hero that Shakespeare creates of the character Macbeth. So let's get into the actual scene. Where again, we are introduced to thunder, lightning and rain. Enter three witches. The witches arrange to meet when the battle's lost and won. And this symbolizes, this is symbolic and this is rhetorized when at the end of Act 1, Scene 2, King Duncan says, what well, he has lost, Macbeth, noble Macbeth, had won. As a result, we see that now everything's fallen into picture. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. Everything's fallen into play. The first words Macbeth says is, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. Now, this can have multiple interpretations. I've actually given you four. The first one, Macbeth is referring to their recent success in the battle. Number two, Macbeth is referring to the weather. The fact is so foul and fair. 
Number three, Macbeth's comment is reference to the light, the fact he can't see. And number four, the meaning is unclear and it's mysterious. Just like the witches, they speak in tongues and riddles. Macbeth's words are not clear. Now, if we go to the first one, for Macbeth, the day is both fair and foul. Because it has brought a bloody battle on his, on one hand and a Scottish victory, his own personal gain on the other. He may also be referring to the fair outcome of the battle versus the fair, the foul weather on the heath. Similarly, it's quite interesting because now this is the last word that the witches speak. Foul is fair, fair is foul. Macbeth, he twists it around and he says so foul and fair a day I have not seen. Therefore we can interpret that perhaps Macbeth has fallen under the trap of the witches and he's already under the snare and it echoes the motif of ambivalence paradox and contrast which runs throughout Macbeth because the witches say fair is foul foul is fair and then Macbeth says so foul and fair a day I have not seen. Therefore contrasting what they have said paradoxically. So, the witches speak to Macbeth and they give him three prophecies. They say to him, All hail Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Glams. Second witch says, All hail Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Cordo. And the third witch says, All hail to Macbeth, thou shalt be king hereafter. Now, an important information that you need to know is Macbeth is already Thane of Glams as he inherited this title from his father, Sinel. Therefore, the first prophecy, not really a prophecy, but it's already come to pass. Macbeth is already Thane of Glams, and in his head, he's already saying, yes, I know I'm Thane of Glams. But now, the second prophecy, all hail to Macbeth, Thane of Cordo. For Macbeth, the Thane of Cordo is already living. He doesn't know, Macbeth does not know that the Thane of Cordo has become a traitor. And this is interesting because to Macbeth, he's thinking, what? He's already Thane of Cordo, right? The Thane of Cordo already lives. How can I be Thane of Cordo? Therefore, the third prophecy, that I'll be king hereafter, this doesn't make sense to him as well because the Thane of Cordo is alive and the witches are prophesying he's going to be Thane of Cordo. The king lives. Now, so the prophecy is, you are going to be Thane of Cordo you're going to be Thane of Cordo, uh, Glams. Sorry, you're going to be Thane of Glams. You're going to be Thane of Cordo, and you'll be future king. To Banquo, they say that you are lesser than Macbeth, but greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. And again, this is speaking in rhymes. Lesser than Macbeth and greater hints that Banquo will never rise so far as Macbeth. Because he will never become a king. Yet his reputation will never sink so low. And a spoiler alert for you. At Act 1, Act 3, Scene 1, Banco is going to be killed. He says not so happy, yet so much happier. Similarly, this is double-edged. Because he's not as happy because he gets murdered later on. Yet he's much happier. Banco will die a violent death. But he'll be spared the psychological torment and hell that Macbeth experiences by the end of the play. And if Banquo's children will be kings, the third prophecy, thou shalt get kings, thou, thou be not. If Banquo's children will be kings, we can infer that Macbeth won't be. And Macbeth makes the same assumption and motivates some of his later bloodthirsty actions as he desperately tries to thwart the witch's predictions. So the three prophecies in simple layman's terms, you're not going to be as happy as your friend, but in one way you will be happier. Number two, your children won't be kings, but you won't you you won't be. Number three, you're not as important as your friend, but in another way you are much more important. So a key quotation we need to go through: the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betrays in deepest consequence. Banquo says this to Macbeth after seeing Macbeth actually listen to the witches. He says that they tell us half-truths. So an instrument is a tool to implement, especially one for precision work. He's saying that these witches are instruments. They're 
specifically used for darkness, darkness referring to the devil's work. The witches use small amounts of truths, honest trifles, like their predictions to weave grand lies. Now this is something similar. What some people do is they'll tell you small truths and you'll believe them and trust them. But in reality they give you a big lie and you'll you'll actually go and trust them. So this is like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Now here we have deception appearances abound in the play. And this will be Macbeth's ultimate downfall because he doesn't see the big image here. He sees a short-term goal that I'm going to be king. But he doesn't become king for that long because later on he gets killed by Macduff. Now the deepest consequence in result or effect, typically one that is unwelcome or unpleasant. And as a result, Banco explains to him often the witches bring about damnation as an aged evil to tell us simple truths, to make us trust them. But in order to, for us to dis be deceived so that we don't think about the bigger important issues. Now, a concept that gets portrayed here from Banco to Macbeth, Banco becomes Mac uh, Macbeth's foil. A foil in fiction is a character which contrasts another character, usually the protagonist, and as a result, it highlights the characters, the, the qualities of that character. Macbeth becomes Banco's foil. For, Banco becomes Macbeth's foil. As a result, every any action that Macbeth does highlights Banco's his holiness. As a result, right, any action that Macbeth commits or takes out, carries out, makes Banco seem even holier. Any action that Macbeth, that Banco does, makes Macbeth seem more of a villain. The, the similar scenario here. Harry Potter, Draco Malfoy is not really the antagonist, not really the villain. But as a result of Draco Malfoy's actions, Mac, uh, Harry Potter is seen as a more uh, heroic character. Finally, a key quotation. Macbeth says to the Thane of Ross, when the Thane of Ross and Angus come to them, to him, he says that you are going to be the Thane of Cordor as a result of your actions and as a reward. Macbeth says to him, the Thane of Cordor lives. Why do you dress me in his borrowed robes? Now, this is significant. Firstly, because he's speaking to Angus. Secondly, Macbeth says these are borrowed robes meaning they belong to someone else. And this is quite significant because later on he borrows the robes, quote-unquote, he borrows the robe from the king. He takes the title of the king. He usurps, meaning he takes it by force. This is truly an unearned title. It's quite interesting because this is where his ambition drives him. He doesn't even realize that even by saying, why do you dress me in his borrowed robes, he later on borrows robes from someone else and again going back to the Angus quote Angus in Act 5 scene 2 refers to Macbeth and says like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief meaning that the robe of a giant was so vast and Macbeth the thief the dwarf the small vertically challenged small vertically challenged dwarf he is the one that Macbeth is trying to fill shoes in. So Macbeth speaks in a soliloquy after hearing the prophecy, after affirming that I'm going to become the Thane of Cordor. He says, cannot be ill, cannot be good, if ill. Why hath it given me earnest of success, commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cordor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion, whose horrid image doth unfix my hair? and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature. Present fears are less than horrible imagings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man that function is smothered in some ice, and nothing is but what is not. So let's go into it. Number one, cannot be ill, cannot be good if ill. This reveals a deep state of confusion. 
The eccentric juice of punctuation here helped to show the lines down, as if Macbeth is thinking very carefully about his actions. Number two, hyperbole here is used to establish how strongly against the idea of murder Macbeth really is. He talks about murder being against the use of nature, which is important as nature will resurface as a motif later in the play. So here, Macbeth is confused. He, he's against the idea of regicide, against the idea of committing murder and treason. And But here, he says, My thought whose murder yet is but fantastical. Macbeth reveals his thought is on murder. His first fatal flaw is to believe the witches. His second is to take matters into his own hands to get what he wants. Finally, he reveals that the thought of murder shakes so my single state of man. This reveals the inner doubt and weakness. Again, a fatal flaw that may, he's confused. He doesn't know what to believe here. So, this is the entirety of Act 1, Scene 3. The most important parts where you need to learn. Thank you for viewing. Like and subscribe. And be ready for the next video where I'm going to detail re regarding Act 1, Scene 4 of Macbeth. Thank you so much.